Elders, deacons, uh, preachers, and saints, this is lesson number nine in the series. The title of this particular lesson, Laying On of Hands. We're going to talk about the laying on of hands, but first uh, perhaps a little review of the uh, material we've uh, covered. In the first eight lessons of this series, we've dealt with the qualifications and responsibilities of both elders and uh, deacons. And we said that uh, elders uh, were mature Christian men chosen by preachers or other elders according to uh, the situation. Uh, and they were chosen based on specific qualifications um, that are outlined in the Bible in the New Testament. And uh, their task was to provide leadership uh, for the church through their teaching, through their prayer life example, and their uh, shepherding uh, of, the, of the flock and all of that and all of uh, what entails in shepherding the flock. And then we said that deacons were Christian men, mature in the faith, uh, chosen by the congregation and from the congregation according to, again, certain qualifications found in the New Testament, and confirmed by the elders to carry out certain tasks. Now we dealt with two main controversial issues concerning elders and deacons. I'm sure there are perhaps more questions and more issues, but the two that always come up when we, you know, when we talk about a uh, selection process and uh, uh, you know, getting new elders, or getting new deacons. First of all, the passage uh, where the list of qualifications are that says uh, he must be the husband of one wife. And that has been interpreted to mean a lot of different things, and I'm not going to go over all of that. We did that in the previous lesson. Uh, but a man who has only been married once in his life, uh, that particular interpretation of husband of one wife is certainly correct. There may be other ways of looking at that, and there's biblical evidence to support other ways of looking at that. But if we select a man who has only been married to one woman his entire life. He's not a widower, he's not a divorcee. He's, uh, uh, um, he's uh, presently married to the uh, only woman that he's ever been married to. Um, selecting an elder that has that qualification certainly fulfills the biblical uh, mandate uh, concerning that situation in his life. And certainly he'd be biblically qualified. And then the other, um, uh, the other controversy, if you wish, when we talk about elders and deacons concerns the deacons, uh, that there is some evidence to suggest that there may have been women who served as deacons. Uh, however, the majority of the clear evidence in the Bible supports the, uh, uh, the teaching that only men were appointed as deacons and we are once again biblically correct to select only men for this role in the church. And I, I, I want to underline one important idea. If the only information, if the only evidence, if the only teaching that we look at to resolve this issue, you know, deacons, deaconesses, you know, if all we look at is the Bible, then there is you know, there's nothing to support uh, the idea that women um, should serve as deaconesses in the church. And there's overwhelming evidence that only men served in this role in the early church. As far as teaching and context and so on and so forth, it supports the idea that uh, men um, uh, serve as deacons. Again, we went all over that in a little more depth in a few lessons, uh, uh, in lessons, previous lessons. Now, I didn't mean to say, I'd like to say one other thing about that. I didn't mean to say that those who see these two issues in other ways you know, are heretics or they're going to hell. Uh, you know, I'm not condemning people who have another opinion about this because in our brotherhoods some people have different opinions of this. What I am saying is that after weighing the evidence and carefully considering the teachings that are found in the Bible, as a Bible teacher, I felt that the prudent and biblical and most edifying interpretation was the one put forth last week and the one that should guide us in our selection process in the future. Okay, 
Well, in today's lesson, I'd like to talk about the selection process and provide some information about the New Testament practice of laying on of hands. Another idea here sometimes we're not quite clear on, and I'd like to clarify that. Um, uh, certainly, it was something that was done in the selection process uh, as we see it unfold in the Bible. So I, I'd like to kind of shed a little bit of light on that. Now in the Bible, hands, especially the right hand, uh, in Hebrew thought had great meaning. Uh, the right hand symbolized power and authority. You know, sit at my right hand, you know, that's power and authority. You, you, you carry the sword uh, in your right hand. And so the image of hands was often used to signify various ideas in the Bible. For example, uh, the dropping of hands was used as a sign of weakness or, or lack of resolution. And to hold up the hands was the remedy for that particular problem. We read in Exodus chapter 17, uh, beginning in verse 10, the following. It says, um, let's see, Joshua did as Moses uh, told him and fought against Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. So it came about when Moses held his hand up that Israel prevailed. And when he let his hand down, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy. Then they took a stone and put it under him and he sat on it. And Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side and one on the other. Thus his hands were steady until the sun set. So Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. So we see there, you know, the raising of a hand, uh, success, strength, the dropping of the hands, um, uh, signifying a defeat, weakness, so on and so forth. Uh, another image is lifting up hands, either lifting up the hands, either signifies some sort of violence or supplication in prayer, uh, depending on the context. So the imagery of lifting up, he lifted up his hands, could be you know, aggression or it could be lifting up the hands in praise and prayer. Another interesting one is placing the hand under the thigh. So one person places their hand under the thigh of another uh, person um, as a way to ratify an agreement. Uh, Abraham's servant, for example, uh, was asked to do this as a promise, as a confirmation to um, Abraham that he would find uh, Isaac a wife from Abraham's own people. Uh, a good example of this, placing the hand under the thigh, we read about that in Genesis chapter 24, verse nine. A comparable idea today would be raising your hand like this. You, know, you give testimony, put your hand on the Bible, you swear to tell the truth. You know, same idea, you're raising your hand. Well, the, the, that, that idea of uh, a confirmation of oath taking uh, in the Old Testament among the, the people at that time was to place the hand under the thigh. Uh, another uh, image uh, in the Old Testament, obviously all the ones that I've spoken about so far in the Old Testament, is the washing of hands. The washing of hands to signify innocence and purity. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 21 verse six. Uh, another example of hand imagery is uh, the idea of transfer. Sometimes both hands were used or laid upon something or someone else to signify a transfer from one to another. For example, Jacob transferring a blessing on his sons, laying hands on them to, to give them a blessing, Genesis 48. Uh, the Levites were ordained as representatives of the people before God. And how did they do that? Well, they placed the hands of the people upon them. The people transferred themselves to the Levites by laying on of hands. Uh, Numbers chapter eight, verse 10. And then uh, in the same vein in the Old Testament, the, the worshipers would place hands on an animal uh, to be offered as a guilt sacrifice, signifying that they were transferring their guilt to the animal, and then the animal's death would be a way of carrying the guilt away. 
uh, Leviticus chapter uh, one, verse four. So a lot of imagery in the Old Testament concerning the hands, uh, very, very uh, uh, specific ways, that using the hands uh, to convey uh, confirmation, transfer, of violence, strength, and so on and so forth. So by the time of the New Testament, the symbolism of the hand, and especially the laying on of hands, was a well-established idea. So Jesus used this gesture, and so did the apostles, in special situations and uh, with various meanings. For example, um, healing. Jesus laid hands on people to heal them, Mark chapter six, verse five, for example. And so did His apostles and His early disciples in Acts chapter nine, verse 12, Ananias with Paul, laying hands, take away the blindness. Uh, in Acts chapter 28, verse eight, Paul uh, doing uh, miraculous healings, laying the hands on, uh, on individuals. The hand was also used as a signal of blessing in the New Testament. Jesus blessed the children by laying His hands upon them, Matthew 19, 13. Interesting thing, however, we don't see this practice carried on by the apostles or the disciples. So this was significant in the sense that we only see Jesus giving that blessing by laying on of hands, by touching. Uh, another one is praying, of course. The Jewish custom was to raise one's hands in prayer, and it seemed that this gesture was still being practiced by Christians, because Paul refers to it in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8. So we even see that today, don't we? Even the Jews today continue to pray uh, in that way. Uh, then in the service of miracles, if you wish, in the book of Acts, we see the apostles laying their hands, on different disciples in order to give them the ability to do various miracles, uh, speaking in tongues, uh, healings, so on and so forth. Now sometimes this ability, the ability to perform miracles, okay, sometimes this ability was conferred without the laying on of hands uh, by anyone, whether it be uh, uh, an apostle or anyone else. All of a sudden that person had that power, not many, you know, the apostles, they received you know, the empowering of the Spirit to, to do miracles. No one laid hands on them. And then Cornelius, right, in the middle of, uh, of Peter's uh, speech, if you wish, he, uh, we see Cornelius, his household, begin to speak in tongues and so on and so forth. Um, and Peter even refers to the idea that they received the Spirit in the same way that we did. What's that? Well, without any human intervention, God simply empowered them. And then, of course, Paul, uh, the apostle, he received the power to do miracles without any intervention of some individual. You know, none of the apostles did that. Uh, however, um, when it was given by the laying on of hands, it was always the apostles who were doing the laying on of hands. You see the point I'm trying to make here? So of course God could empower anybody to do miracles according to His choice, but from the New Testament the only three that we see Him doing that for are, are, are the apostles, first of all, Cornelius, that one instant, and then Paul, the Saul who became Paul, the apostles, those three. And aside from those three, you don't see anyone else receive the power to do miracles directly from God. Um, anyone who received the ability to speak tongues, do miracles, so on and so forth, received that power through the laying on of hands by the apostles. That's, that's the point I'm trying to make here. Okay. So the apostles could transfer this to someone. They could empower someone through the laying on of hands to do miracles to speak in tongues. And that person that had that ability uh, could perform miracles, okay, but they could not pass on that ability to someone else. All right, is that clear? So let's read uh, Acts chapter eight, just to get an example of, how, uh, of what that looks like in Acts uh, chapter eight, beginning in verse 14. 
It says, now when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Okay. For he had not yet fallen upon any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Well, I want to stop there. So if they have been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, they have received forgiveness of sins, correct? Because in Acts 2, uh, 37, 38 and following, Peter says to the crowd, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of sins, right? And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So we know that uh, at baptism, uh, an individual receives forgiveness of sin and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so let's go back to Acts chapter eight. What happened to the people here? Well, the people here, it says the Spirit hadn't fallen upon them. You know, the Bible uses different terms to explain you know, the same thing. Um, that the Spirit falls on them means they hadn't been empowered yet. Okay, they hadn't receive the ability to do uh, miraculous things, whether it was speaking in tongues or interpreting or healing and so on and so on. None of them had received that power. We know that they had received the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, why? Because it says they had been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So they're saved, they have forgiveness of sins, they have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and we know the indwelling of the Holy Spirit uh, among other things, is the thing that guarantees your resurrection. Because Paul says in Romans 8, if the spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead dwells in you, the spirit that, rose, uh, you know, that resurrected Him from the dead will also resurrect you from the dead. So you know, why is it important to have the Holy Spirit? Because in the end, it's through the power of the Holy Spirit that we're risen from the dead. Okay, so these people here, if you're following my line, they had been baptized, therefore they had the forgiveness of sins and also the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. But then, in verse 17, watch what it says. It says, then they, meaning the apostles, began laying their hands on them and they were receiving the Holy Spirit. Okay, so what does that mean? They already had the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. What does it mean now they were receiving the Holy Spirit? Again, remember the Bible, describes sometimes the very same phenomenon in different ways. We know they had the indwelling of the Spirit because you received that at baptism. So what's the difference between the indwelling of the Spirit and receiving the Spirit that Paul is talking about, excuse me, that Luke is talking about here? Well, the answer is in verse 18. Uh, and it's given by the witness of Simon. It says, now when Simon saw that the Spirit was bestowed through the laying on of the apostles' hand, he offered them money, saying, give me this authority, or give this authority to me as well, so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. So what was happening? Well, it says Simon could see the Spirit. Well, what could he see? You can't, you can't with your eyes see the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So what could he see? Well, he saw that those upon whom the apostles laid their hands after they had been baptized received the power of the Holy Spirit, the empowering of the Holy Spirit. What Simon was seeing were the works. He saw these people after the apostles laid hands on them he saw them begin to speak in tongues and do other miraculous things. And he said, wow, I want that power too. Give me the power so you know, whoever I lay my hands on, they can, you know, they, can perform these, they can perform these miracles. So in other words, just to kind of summarize this, you could receive the ability to do miracles directly from God, as the apostles and Cornelius and Paul did, or you could receive the power to do miracles through the laying on of the hands of the apostles. But if you were not an apostle, you could not transfer this to someone else. Okay? So it's important to uh, remember that. So after the apostles um, uh, died, of course, 
uh, historically, there's you know, a lot less recording or observation of miracles being performed. Why? Because the people that they had given that power to, eventually they died off and they were not able to kind of keep it going, if you wish. So you see the apostles dying off and then slowly but surely you see this, the extinguishing of, uh, uh, of examples of individuals performing, uh, performing miracles. Okay? And the reason for that is the conduit or the mediator uh, that God used to empower the church to do these special miracles were the apostles. And once the apostles died off, well, the method that God had chosen for that particular task um, died with them. All right, so a little bit of background about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit we receive at baptism, the empowering of the Spirit, received either from God directly or through the laying on of hands of the apostles. When the apostles eventually died, so died with them the empowering ability to give that gift to individuals in the church. And of course we can say that the reason why they had the power to do miracles is because they had not yet received the full revelation of the word. Uh, the Bible had not yet been all written, all collected, uh, and uh, distributed throughout the uh, churches. And so individuals who did miracles uh, as a witness uh, to the veracity of what they were preaching. In other words, why should we believe what you're saying, Paul? Well, when Paul does a miracle, they say, oh, okay, well, that's, that's proof that what you're saying is true. Eventually, we, we have everything. We, we received everything. A few centuries later, uh, the entire record of the New Testament, uh, along with the Old Testament, was available to people and it served as the witness, if you wish, uh, to uh, support the preaching uh, of the gospel. Okay, so I, I want to get back to our laying on of hands. So we, we talked about the laying on of hands here uh, done by the apostles in order to transfer various gifts. Another uh, instance in the New Testament is for, uh, of laying on of hands is for ordination purposes. The term ordination simply means to appoint or to make stand, and it's used in the New Testament to describe a situation where one person is appointed to a role or a task. So the laying on of hands uh, symbolizes the transfer of authority and agreement uh, to um, other, another's new role or task by a certain authority. In other words, you know, we saw the idea of transfer in the Old Testament, right? They'd lay hands on an animal, uh, uh, signifying the transfer of their sins, if you wish, uh, to that animal. All right? The laying on of hands was the symbolism of that, of that transfer. So in the New Testament, the laying on of hands from one individual to another is the same idea, to transfer. Those in authority lay hands on an individual to transfer, the symbol of transferring uh, the authority or the role to that particular uh, individual. Um, and so uh, we see this transferring of authority you know, through the laying on of hands. Uh, in Acts chapter six, for example, the elders, apostles rather, laid hands on these men, these seven men, and they became deacons, right? Uh, in Acts chapter 13, they laid hands on uh, Paul and, 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 and Barnabas as they left uh, to do mission work. So we, we, you know, we transfer the role, the authority, uh, the ministry, we commend into service those who go into missions. And then in 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 6, we find out that the evangelist Timothy was assigned his role as an evangelist. How? Through the laying on of hands of the elders in the church. So there's no, you know, we're not, there's no magic here, okay? We're, we're not talking about that. We're talking about the use of laying on of hands as a symbol that authority, responsibility is being transferred for, from one to another individual. Now, the question comes up, do we lay hands today? We, we saw examples here in the Bible of uh, people laying hands in various uh, situations, but the big question is, well, do we do that today? I believe that we should when the situation calls for it. 
So um, I'm confident of this because we have plenty of examples, right? If the apostles did it, then we can and should when it is scriptural. So when do we lay hands? So let's take a look. Uh, how about for healing? Well, we no longer have the miraculous powers to heal and so we don't lay hands symbolically uh, to demonstrate this. Certainly in visiting someone who is ill, the idea of touching or hugging to encourage, to show affection, but uh, if I touch someone or shake their hand or give them a hug, I'm transferring my affection, I'm demonstrating my affection to them as a brother or sister in Christ, uh, but not any, you know, I have no power to heal anyone. So we don't use that uh, you know, in, the, in, the, in the context of healing someone. Uh, we see faith healers doing this on, on TV and that's a, whole other, that's a whole other discussion. As I said before, uh, we believe that the Bible teaches that, uh, that God does not empower individuals, no longer does that today, uh, no longer empowers them with miraculous powers because we have the word of God as our witness to the resurrection, as our witness to the, the powers that the apostles had and so on and so forth. All right, how about blessing? Um, do we lay hands to give a blessing to someone else? Well, we're all brothers. Without authority over each other, we need to actually be in submission to one another, and so we can pray for each other, but I can't give you a blessing like Jesus could. And I want you to note that there is no further mention of this after Jesus is gone. We see Jesus doing it for the children, right? But we don't see the apostles doing it, so it's not something that they did. They didn't come and lay hands to, to give some sort of blessing. They would pray. Uh, to give a blessing, and we can still do that today. How about for praying? You know, what, what are the use of hands for prayer? So there's all kinds of positions to pray, and if one wants to lift hands, he or she is free to do so, I believe. Uh, the New Testament says that they were still doing it. No reason why we can't if we really want to today. I believe it's a personal choice to express um, and to be perceived as uh, reverent to God and in our congregation we've seen that some individuals lift their hands when they pray and that's fine if they choose to do that. It's certainly a biblical idea. How about for miracles? I think we've talked about that. We, we no longer do miracles. Uh, we don't have that empowerment anymore and so we can no longer transfer this power as, as well. Can't do that. And then there's the idea of ordination. So we still do that however. We still you know, commend and appoint men uh, to preach. We still select men from the congregations to be deacons. Uh, we certainly have individuals that go on mission trips and so on and so forth. So I think we can and we should use this symbol to signify our approval and our appointment of people into ministry. And we've done it in the past, right? When elders, uh, are appointed or when deacons are appointed, you know, the elders go and they lay hands on them and someone offers a prayer, someone leaves on a mission trip, the huddle, the laying on of hands of the church, the praying. So we continue to do this to symbolize that these individuals or this person has been commended officially by the church into this particular service. Okay, so that gives you some of the background information as to why we have continued to do this type of thing uh, here in Choctaw. Now, uh, just on a kind of a personal note, you probably have noticed that uh, we're always trying to make an effort to progress, to have progress here in the church, to grow the church. Uh, we want to create an environment for growth. You know, we know that God causes the growth, right? God causes the growth. But we are the ones responsible for creating the environment for growth by developing each area of ministry. So we want each area of ministry, evangelism ministry and education ministry, fellowship ministry, the worship ministry, service ministry, those five biblical ministries. Lots of people are working in those areas, trying to grow those areas in order to contribute to the overall growth of the church. You know, we plant and we water and God does cause the growth. That's a promise. But there is no growth without watering. You know, we got to plant and water. If we don't do that part, then God will not cause growth because you know, there's no seed being planted. 
So in this effort at progress, we want to become a church that first of all uses you know, the latest and the best technology to preach the gospel and to spread the word of God as far as we can, far away uh, and as many uh, places. You know, aside from the missionaries we actually support who are on the ground, uh, who are talking and preaching and teaching people face to face, we also use the internet with our Bible talk uh, ministry. Uh, we reach thousands and thousands of people who hear God's word, who receive the teachings, and they themselves pass it on and use our resources to teach others. So we, uh, we um, feel that progress in this area requires us to expand the reach of our uh, evangelism and um, proclamation of God's word to more and more people uh, beyond uh, just the, uh, our own community. Uh, we also um, are a church, um, uh, church that has a, a worship place, a meeting place that is cheerful and convenient and able to handle a good crowd, you know, where it's easy to hear and see and participate in, in worship. I know that the, we're the church, right? The people, we're the church. The building is just the building. But if it's, you know, if it's 20 degrees outside and it's cold and there's no heat in the building and so it's only 38 degrees in the building and, and, and it's very dark and you know, I mean, yeah, we are the church, but it's going to be hard to worship, right? We need light, we need heat and so on and so forth in order to kind of you know, blot those type of things out of our minds so we can focus on the matter at hand. So, so part of progress, okay, is to make sure that that environment is stable and comfortable so that we can focus on uh, uh, the worship that we want to offer to God in a decent and in an orderly, uh, orderly fashion. Also, growth requires a, a program where we're teaching. Jesus said, teaching them all that I have commanded you. So we have a command not only to go out and proclaim, but we also have a command from Jesus Himself to teach. And so an education program that can serve children as well as adults in the study of God's word and provide ample opportunities for spiritual growth and spiritual development. A lot of work goes into the program of teaching children, you know, right from babies in cradle row all the way through middle school and high school. We have a youth and family minister that designs a program specifically tailored for that age group. Uh, and then of course our adult uh, teaching, uh, Bible teaching uh, program. Um, uh, our way of fulfilling that command, teaching the church all the things that Jesus has commanded us, has given us to, to know. And of course, a successful program can't be successful uh, without participation. So we're always encouraging uh, people to participate, to make the effort to participate in our Bible classes. And then of course, growing churches have an efficient and well-trained staff that can manage church affairs and minister to the congregation in a loving and in an effective way. And I think that, I think that happens here, right? When you call, uh, certainly Celestia, what a great job that she does uh, in uh, serving the needs of the congregation, always uh, pleasant, always ready to uh, assist those who call. Sarah, of course, the bookkeeping, all the questions about the, the finances of the church and you know, the business side of the, of the congregation. So a well-maintained a well staff, Gail and uh, Gloria and others you know, that maintain uh, the building. You know, they're little things, but they're important things, right? Someone has to show up very early on Sunday morning or on Saturday to prepare the communion that we will share on Sunday. Again, it doesn't just prepare itself, right? So there's three, four hundred people get together, all of them are having communion. That has to be prepared and ready in advance. All these little details that work together. A growing church has individuals involved at every level of service to make sure that the whole progresses properly. So this is the kind of progress that the changes that we make represent. However, I also want to finish up my lesson this morning um, by talking about some of the things that won't change and must not change uh, whenever you know, a church is going through 
progress as, as we are. First of all, the Bible is God's only and complete revelation to man. Now, we may put the Bible on the computer or on television, but it will always remain the inspired word of God. That's not going to change. See, some things change, how we proclaim it, how we distribute it, and how we show it, you know, that, that changes. But what doesn't change is our teaching and our belief that the Bible is God's complete inspired word, complete in the sense that we don't need any other information from any other book to understand how to please God, how to serve God, and so on and so forth. That's not going to change. Um, uh, the building may change. You know, uh, we, we want to do some expansion in certain areas. Elders change, we know that. We've, we've added some, some have retired. De deacons change, ministers change. But this congregation is dedicated to being a New Testament church. We're devoted to New Testament Christianity. In other words, we do Bible things in Bible ways, and our goal is to strive always to be faithful to the Word in all things. That doesn't change. Someone says, well, you know, we need a, a mission statement. Well, we have a mission statement. And our mission statement is we want to be a New Testament church. And if we're a New Testament church, if we are a church according to the church that is described and outlined in the New Testament, then we are doing God's will. And you know, that's, that's not, you know, that's not uh, condemning someone else and sending somebody else to hell, no. What we're saying is the only thing we want for ourselves is to understand what does the New Testament teach about the church. In other words, the New Testament describes what the church should be, how it should be organized, and so on and so forth. So what we want to be is the church that's described in the New Testament. Now, don't get me wrong, I don't mean we want to be the Corinthian church, because they had a lot of problems, right? Or we want to be the Ephesian church, or we want to be that church. Those churches existed in those days, they were trying the very same thing we're trying. And they succeeded to a greater or lesser degree. You see what I'm saying? So we're not trying to be the Corinthian church or the Ephesian church or the church at the Derby or the, you know, the church in, uh, in, in uh, Thessalonica. We're trying to be the church at Choctaw in the modern age. And we're trying to follow the New Testament as carefully as we can to be the church that has been described in the New Testament in general, okay? So that's not going to change. The building changes, stuff changes, but that doesn't change. And then finally, uh, well, thirdly, uh, people over projects. You know, we're growing, we're developing, people over projects. We need machines, of course, we need to renovate, we need parking spaces, but these things are in the service of people who are in the service of of God. So the love of the brethren is what makes this congregation a special place. What people say all the time, what a friendly church. You know? I mean, as one of the preachers, I'd love for them to say, wow, this is the greatest preaching church, you know, the best preachers in the world. You know? <laughs> but it's more important that they say, what a loving church, what a kind church. It's a special place. So the projects and the events and the changes to the building and new deacons or elders or ministers, whatever, these are things that are done to help maintain that environment, that environment of love and care that, that members have for one another and hopefully, hopefully, that love and care and welcome that they have for people who visit, for newcomers, for people who are just beginning their walk in Christ. Very, very important. And I think I, I can easily and confidently speak for uh, Marty and for Mike Coghill uh, when I say that our goal as ministers is to try to maintain that environment of Christian love and Christian service. And then finally, of course, we're interested in souls. I mean, our work, our service, our efforts are all directed towards the primary goal of winning souls. Winning souls is job one. So everything, you know, sometimes it doesn't look like it's soul winning, but everything points to that. Everything is working towards that. Because a faithful New Testament church is proclaiming the gospel to the lost and they're ministering to the saved. 
So that's, you know, if you're saying, well, what is our church about? We're proclaiming to the lost, we're ministering to the saved. So these things, as I mentioned, never change. No matter what the building looks like, no matter who is ministering in it, hopefully these things will always be the same. Today, tomorrow, 100 years from now, uh, will continue always to be the same. Okay, so that's our lesson. We, we kind of went off target a little bit here, talking about the uh, laying on of hands and a little bit about you know, uh, things in a local congregation that, that need to always remain no matter what changes. Uh, next time we'll get back, focus on our series elders, preachers, deacons, and saints. So that's it for this time. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.